Hi, I'm Roy Collin, and I'm the creator of the podcast. You can find everything about me and the five podcasts on bio.link forward slash podcaster, and you'll find it in the QR code there. I'd also like to thank my sponsors. If you or someone you know is struggling with anxiety and want to know how to be 100% anxiety free in six weeks without therapy or drugs, Daniel Packard Anxiety Solution Program Company offers a six weeks system that permanently solves anxiety at an astounding 90% success rate. People who join the program only pay at the end once they have clear, measurable results. If you're interested in learning more, go to permanentanxietysolutions.com where you can book a free consultation with Daniel. Do you have high blood pressure or want to get off the meds? Doctors are amazed at what Zona Plus can do. Get a $50 discount with my code ROY. Go to zona.com slash discount slash ROY and you see the QR code for all my sponsors down at the end. Quality Polish manufacturer of metal products for telecommunication and workshop equipment and other metals. If you'd like a brochure, you see it in the QR code and you just let us know if you would like a quotation shipped internationally and very competitive rates. I hope you enjoy this week's podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Freedom International live stream. We're very excited and honored to have John Waters with us. I know John is well-known, acclaimed worldwide, and he's a busy man, but he puts time for us so that our audience could also get that education and empowerment. Because for me, um, John Waters, when, whether he speaks or he writes, because he's a talker and he's a writer, as he would say, as a storyteller as well. And it, there's always something that you can generate from and draw from that will make sense to what's happening nowadays. So when I received the uh, article or the, in his substack, The Wonder of You, first it brought me a smile because I really like that someone is writing about the wonder of me. So a little bit about John, as I said, he's a uh, commentator, he's a writer and author of many books, I believe 10 or more and <clears throat> nonfiction books. And so, and I let John also, um, he never stops writing. He never stops being involved in different platforms and he's always welcoming people who need a serious conversation that could make sense. So John, do you have anything more to add on what you do currently? Uh, <clears throat> well, no, I'm to be found. If people are interested, I'm on Substack, John Waters Unchained. Uh, I've been writing there for three years now. Um, I started, I, you know, I was a skeptic about, generally about online uh, platforms because <clears throat> I think there's a difference between writing on a page or reading on a page and reading on a, on a screen. You know, I think it's an entirely different thing and, you know, it becomes a very expedient thing when you have a phone or a, an iPad or something, you know. So I like... I loved when I was writing for pages, you know, in, in, in newspapers, in magazines and in books. But for the moment, anyway, that that, that seems to be on the wane. And, and so I'm, I'm, I've eventually surrendered uh, to, to, the, to the online madness and I am, I'm on Substack. But I, I don't do any other. Um, but I don't know if that's actually social media. Some people call it social media, which is a bit daft, really. But I, I, I don't do anything Twitter. I think Twitter is, is the, the pit of hell. And and uh, you know, I don't have anything to do with any of that stuff. Uh, no, I don't. That's all, really. Yeah, I, I I have a number of books out there, but you know, you can find them on various platforms and on that horrible place that starts with an A. If you really are stuck, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, but it, 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 they're, they're they're with multiple publishers, and it's the way things go. You know, <clears throat> they go out of print, and they're hard to get. But you can get them secondhand very easily, I think, if you want them. So, yeah. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and John is in a good, good company because with me are two Irish friends of mine. Oops, I'm trying to <laughs> put your names on. And one is Roy Colan, and he lives in... Uh, uh, Poland, but he's Irish, and 
Carl Moore, Dr. Carl Moore. He lives right in Ireland. So Carl and John, you could meet at some point. <laughs> Although I think Carl will tell you a story that he did see you one time and he just quickly said, I love your works. And he just started going away without saying, hello, John, I am Carl Moore. <laughs> Oh. You're right, yeah, Carl. That's, so, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what he did yeah, one time. Yeah, I've, so I've, I'm so I've so happy walk, that I've I've seen you, John, walking around John Leary, and uh, oh I think yeah, was, right. yeah, yeah. So I used to live there, uh, just near the uh, People's Park, and uh, oh. so the story Grace talking about is I was going up to the doctor and uh, I was late, so I was running. And I saw you at the corner. I said, John Waters. And he looked around, and I went, love your work, and ran off. So it was my little hit and run. Uh, but, yeah, I love your work. And, well, thank uh, you very much. Really well, I, I, I'm in the People's Park quite a bit. I, I love and I love area. his. It's a lovely I'm park, not even yeah. Irish, but I love his. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so these are, these and, are pretty uh, trying times here in, in, in Ireland. Um, like I've moved out west uh, after the uh, the lockdowns, it drove me crazy. Um, so I just I just moved out west. But when you come out west, you start to see they can't get their fingers off the country. They want to take the gold out of the earth. They want to put up wind turbines everywhere. They want to plant trees. It's all bureaucracy. Yeah, but. Uh, Living out the West, there's a, there's a different sort of people, I feel. You start to feel connected to to Ireland. Where Dublin, I never, even though I was brought up there, um, it's not the same. It's like it's almost another country. Maybe that's uh, probably a collective of experiences growing up there. But um, there you have yeah. it. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, I'm in the West right now. I'm in Sligo. Um, uh, oh, I, spend okay. time, I spend as much time as I can down here, um, and I agree with you. You know, Dublin is 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 kind of an alien city now. I, I think it always, to some extent, always was, because it was always kind of like a colonial capital more than it was a capital city of the, the country, and it had never shaken off that mentality. I think, uh, and there's that sense. And you talk about the the this, this the. Uh, the, the desecration of the, the the landscape and so on, which is a, an enormous issue, you know. But the problem is, there's a very strange phenomenon, actually, whereby uh, Dublin seems to act as a as a kind of a toxic filter, if you like, a kind of a reverse filter, that when even when the people from the west and all these elect politicians and they go to Dublin, they begin to behave in a way that is hostile to where they came from and to the countryside. And so everything that emanates from from the capital in that sense is toxic, uh, uh, because they just they you see there is culture ideologically in Ireland, there has long been a repugnance in in official culture of the countryside and of of the culties as they, we are called, yeah. uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's kind of a, a kind of a pseudo uh, sophistication on the on behalf of of some Dubliners. Uh, which I've written a bit about long ago. I used to write. I wrote a book years ago with a section with, when I dealt with that. The, it's called Dublin Four. You know the Dublin Four mentality, uh, and uh, and it's very now it has become. It's not a joke anymore. You know it's beyond a joke now because we have a government which is probably the worst government in the history of, of Ireland. Certainly, you know since since independence and and uh, uh, like they they clearly detest their own people. Like they actually act and they speak with hatred for their own people, and and uh, I don't know where that's going to end. You know, I can't. You can't do that. You know, I don't think if you're a politician, but maybe you can in a totalitarian system, which is what they're trying to create. And uh, so that's kind of the battle that that we're joined in. You know, I mean that that for the last uh, forty three months now since this thing kicked off uh, in in the spring of twenty twenty. Um, you know, it is seemed to me to be very clear that this was kind of some kind of final battle, potentially, and that we had to resist at all costs. Um, but, you, you know, it, it's, it happens in slow motion. You know, all of the normative and kind of anticipated timeframes don't work anymore. You know, you think there will be a reaction to this, but there isn't, or there's a tiny reaction. 
and it goes on again for another like another year maybe who knows like and 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 you think you know it's like everybody is in in, in an existential sense moving in slow motion you know and it, you know it's just it's almost imperceptible if there is movement at all why do you yeah, I've noticed that too. I mean, we used to be known as the Fighting Irish, but now it seems to be, you know, roll over. Uh, yeah, Irish. And I always, I was trying to wonder why that is. What has happened? And one explanation I had is, is there's a lot of people with mortgages, and they know if they say something incorrect or do something in, improper at work, they may be censored or laid off, or, and then they can't pay their mortgage and they're on the street. In the old days, as, as little as we had, um, you know, things were a lot less expensive for room and board. I, I remember going to college and people would get room and board. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, a bed set. And it was like 45 pounds for a week, including yeah. the yeah. evening meal. Now... Well, yeah, that's right. But, yeah. but now, I mean, they're filling the country up with... with fake refugees uh, yeah. who are taking up all the accommodation. Students have to just make their own arrangements and so on. And, and that's a part of what I mean, the contempt they show for the people that yeah. they're supposed to be there to serve. Uh, but I think there's a deeper reason, <clears throat> a lot of deeper reasons for what's happening or why Ireland became so craven in this period. I mean, it, there was always that degree of cravenness in, in the Irish personality going back to the colonial period, although people don't say, I hate this when people say Ireland was never a colony of England, or you know, this is nonsense. You know, I mean, of course, nominally, no, we weren't. They called us part of their empire. We were a colony. Ireland is a self-standing nation historically, and it was taken over by Britain. It was a colony, right? But so the, the, the post-colonial mentality, which is full of kind of complexes and, you know, uh, 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 pathologies, you know, of self-hatred and mimicry and all of those things, you know, which affects parts of Africa very strongly also. And, and Franz Fanon wrote about that. Uh, this He was a Caribbean uh, psychiatrist uh, who worked in Algeria during the Civil War in the late 50s. And, and he, he worked as a psychiatrist and he wrote two, several books out of this whole, you know, this his experience of observing the effects of this on individual patients. And, and, the, and la at the larger level then, psychically, as a, as, a, as, a, as a societal level. And when I read those books, The Wretched of the Earth and uh, Black Skin, White Ma Mask, I mean, these, are, these books could have been written about Ireland with very minor changes. I mean, you'd probably have to change the title of Black Skin, White Mask to White Skin, White Masks or something like that. Uh, but otherwise, they would they, they would be completely applicable to Ireland. Another thing that's that's I think key is that there was, I believe, and this is a thesis I've been developing now for the last year or so. There was uh, what the Spanish call an auto ope, uh, self coup in Ireland in 2011 after the collapse of the economic the the, the boom, the Celtic Tiger, when the Troika, the the three, the European Commission, World Bank, and IMF came in and basically took away Irish economic sovereignty and basically reduced us to a slave nation again in, in, in very clear and, and uh, terms. And uh, uh, that then after that, there was kind of like a rescue, I believe. And because I have done a study of 2011 and the, a series of events in it which show that there were really extraordinary events happening. For example, like just off the top of my head, in the one week in May that year, there were two state visits in the same week, almost back to back, the Queen of England and the President of the United States, Barack Obama. And there was like, like maybe five minutes between the trips, you know? And, and each one was treated as a kind of a psychological operation because the, the airways were just saturated with hectoring and, and indoctrination in the first instance about our England, our relationship with England, that we had to leave all that behind us and, you know, forget the past and, you know, move on and forgive and forget and all that. And it wasn't really much to talk about anyway. You know, it was just a little prying at the traffic lights and, you know, look, let's fix our own repairs. And, you know, and then uh, when Obama came, a very interesting thing there because there was an incident after he left, immediately afterwards, where the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister, Linda Kenny, <clears throat> was accused of having plagiarised Obama's acceptance speech when he was elected in 2008. 
and used a, a, a section from this, a phrase, a sentence. And all the journalists went crazy about this. Like, and I, I remember writing at the time a lot about how lit ridiculous this was. But I didn't really pay any attention at the time to the, to the sentence that Kenny had used. And it's only very recently I dug it out. Now, this sentence was uttered, you know, while Kenny was standing beside Obama. You know, so if he was going to plagiarize him, I think he would have tried to be at least, you know, a couple of miles away from him or something, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, the sentence was a very strange sentence when you think about it. And you can think about it in two contexts, as I, I, I remembered approximately, but the sense of it will be correct. And, and just think of it in two contexts. Obama in 2008, talking about his election, the first black president of the United States. And then in the Kenny, Taoiseach of Ireland, uh, Prime Minister of Ireland, standing beside Barack Obama, this black president of the United States, in College Green in the centre of Dublin, before a crowd of, you know, maybe several hundred thousand. I can't remember now, but there was a big crowd there. And the sentence was, those who say that the dreams of our ancestors can never be fulfilled, they have their answer here today. Well, you can see why Obama would have said that in 2008. But why would Indy Kenny say that while standing beside him? Barack Obama, he was essentially handing Ireland over to Obama. That's what he would say, and, and to everything Obama represented and everything Obama wanted for the world. And everything that has happened since now has been, there has been a sense in Ireland for, since that of, <clears throat> look, let's forget about this all democracy nonsense. It's a terrible waste of time. Look, at, we've, got, we've got a country to run here. We can't be listening to people's opinions. What do people think we are? You know, we're busy people. We're trying to run the country and make money for ourselves, and you know, keep the, the you know keep the streets clean. You know, and and all these people want to do is express opinions about stuff. They want free speech and freedom to walk down the street and all this kind of nonsense. Oh, it's all out of date. You know, let's just lock them up. Let's just lock them up. Let's take all their spe free speech rights and let them shut up and be happy that they're even allowed to exist. That's the general tenor of Ireland now at a political level. And also replicated in my former profession of journalism, the most obscene profession on the face of the planet. I've said, maybe I said this the last time I was on with you, Grace, but I've, I've, I've asked my wife, Rita, you know, that when I die, if, 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 if there are any obituaries of me and they mention the word journalist, she's immediately to issue a legal letter requiring a correction and clarification that John Waters denounced journalism and, uh, and uh, renounced his, uh, that he was ever a journalist in this world because it has become an obscene profession, a lying profession. And I wrote recently about it because I, I, I had been struggling with the whole idea. Like People use different terms to describe the media. And I don't think any, I mean, on our side, and they say that, you know, they talk about the mainstream media, the MSM, and the, the legacy media is another one. And there's one, the cathedral media, and all of this. And I, like, they, none of them make any sense to me. Legacy of what legacy? Legacy of obscenity and filth? Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, but so I came up with a different one, which is the set aside media. Now, set aside is the phrase that <clears throat> came in the European context, in the European Union about 30 years ago, I remember writing about it, uh, where they, they, it was in relation to, to farmers and their lands. And they were required, very much in the tone of, that you're talking there, Carl, about, you know, that in order to qualify for certain grants, they had to poison their, their fields to make sure that they weren't that capable of growing anything. And in order, so they had to spray them with chemicals so that they would turn yellow, so that the satellite above would be able to see that the farmer wasn't actually working his land and therefore was entitled to be compensated for this. Well, like journalism, that's the same thing has happened to journalism. That's what they've done in a different context, obviously, but they've, they've set aside journalism. They've set aside facts. They've set aside truth. They've set aside ethicality, all of these things. And they said, look, we'll just do whatever you want us to do. We'll just keep paying us. Uh, and, and we don't care. We have no principles anymore. We have renounced all our principles. And, and, you know, just tell us what you want us to say. Tell us what you want us to do, and we'll say and do it. That's what journalism is now. And that's what it has been for 43 months, like in, in the most shocking time, I think, in the history of, of the world, possibly. I mean, I, that's a bit, that's a grand statement. But I don't know. I mean, 
maybe not, <clears throat> maybe there have been worse things at different spots in the world, but when you take the world all together, has there been any period in the entire history, when the entire globe has been affected by something so appalling and so grotesque as this crime that has been committed against us. Yeah, a lot of, I, I, as you were saying that, you know, they're all doing this in the name of being green uh, to reforest, but then they're poisoning the land. And, yeah. uh, and I wonder, you know, are things really being uh thought through uh, never mind just just not even thinking about it or examining it for example um what's what's his name our minister for the environment let us head ryan um what's his first name i forgot eamon ryan. Eamon ryan, yeah. eamon ryan god i don't know why i've forgotten that but he was talking there about a month or so ago about introducing wolves into ireland did you hear about that no i haven't heard that one I thought we already had them. I thought we already had them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm talking about the the original type. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, um, right. yeah, I think they. Yeah. I'm, I was just going to say that the whole idea is is you know it sounds good if you're in Yellowstone or somewhere Wyoming way out in the, in the states where you got hundreds of miles of open virgin land, and yeah. you have ranchers with guns. To protect themselves from bears yeah. and wolves and all kind of cougars, yeah. But here in Ireland, I mean, you can't go more than three miles without encountering civilization. Um, yes, we're a farming agricultural island. We have sheep and cattle. We have people going for walk walks in the mountains on Sunday yeah. afternoons. That's great. And you want to introduce yeah. wolves? I mean, <laughs> well, maybe they were here a long time ago, but it, yeah. There are very few stretches of road in the country where you won't encounter a house at least every half mile or yes, less. Yeah, yeah. But there are a couple of, you know, the, the, the road to Bel Belmullet, for example, uh, from Ballina has quite long stretches of, of which are not populated. But that's very rare. I don't think they would fancy wolves out there either. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think the, the wolves would fancy it all that much either, you know, with all due respect. <laughs> <laughs> They wouldn't, but I mean, that's just, I mean, I was thinking like, why, why would he throw that out there? And nobody's like uh, uh, making fun of such uh, an idea. Everybody's going, oh, this is very green. It'll keep the deer population in check. Well, well that's you all see, they heard, you know? So. Yeah, but I, I think that's, that you've touched on something quite important, I think, there, Carl, in the sense that he, he you know, I think this is a form of gaslighting in, in the sense, but it's an advanced form because what it's doing is, testing people mm -hmm. you see because the other factor that happened in all of this was the muting of the irish gar the garless irish personality and that was done since about since 2014 15 in the anticipation of the so-called marriage referendum and you had these lgbt uh, dogs of war let loose on the population telling people what they could and could not say what they could and could not think and they terrified people. I mean, I've told people, uh, like, you know, I, when I was, I, I, I wasn't at the beginning all that exercised about it, but they came after me before I even opened my mouth about it. And then I said, well, if, if you're going to silence me before I even start talking, I better do something about that, at least. And I did campaign, but I remember actually, uh, I come from from County Roscommon, uh, 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 which is kind of. Uh, it's it's not people say it's midlands it's not it's kind of west because uh, we were, were very close to the Mayo border and the galway border but uh, uh i was invited to, i had been invited for some time to do an uh, a launch of a magazine for some students in the convent in roscommon or in the secondary school in roscommon on the particular day which is in the last we happened to be in the last week of the campaign and when i was go on my way down to to do this I got a call from the headmistress who said, you know, look, this is, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we've had a terrible day. We've been inundated with abusive calls from LGBT uh, people who are saying that if you're allowed to come to speak, they will wreck the place and they will, they will cause eruptions and so on. And I said, well, she said, we've told the police and, and so on, but uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And she says, it's all up to you. It's up to you. If you want to turn around and go home, that's fine. We don't, we wouldn't mind. We wouldn't object because, you know, who needs this? And I, I went ahead. Now, they didn't show up, but they were doing this all the time. 
So this kind of thing, this is, this is, again, that's just a tiny example of the kind of stuff that we're doing. So the effect of that was essentially, I call it mutism, that they essentially imposed a kind of a mutism on the Irish population, which has never been undone. It's still there. It's still effect. Yeah. And it worked through a referendum in 2018 about abortion. And it worked through the COVID period. People are afraid. You see, you know, if you're, if you're you know, anywhere. And friends of mine who have always been very outspoken and talkative tell me now, like, you know, if I ask them something in public, they kind of look, you know, look around them before they answer me, you know. Like they, they want to be careful. I mean, I talk to farmers around where I am here, like, and they talk about, you know, being attacked in public houses by eavesdropping people standing nearby because they said something out of line. Like this is a completely new phenomenon in Ireland. Uh, yeah. You know, being called names, being called racist, you're like, because they've overheard them say something about mass migration and the abuse of the Irish people in that process and so on. So th th there's all of this stuff going on. This is all the stuff of a totalitarian uh, uh, apparatus, which has been very carefully, skillfully built into Ireland now and into all our countries and all, all the West. You see, this is the shocking thing uh, that I don't think we, any of us who are of a certain age Certainly, I, I'm I'm 68 now, and and I I, I can't imagine I can't believe that we are now starting at the in beginning of the processes that we read about in the Soviet Union or in China or and and that people like Orwell and Solzhenitsyn wrote about, and we thought, well, you know, that'll never happen here. You know, we are way past all that. Well, we weren't, and those books and things now they now look like not so much like a predictions as kind of like you know uh, blueprints you know for how they get to do it and and the extraordinary thing about this is that the people that we thought would be the very first out of the traps to resist this had nothing to say about it what you might call the liberal leftists who you know liberty liberal liberty you would think freedom yeah you can't walk you can't leave your house you can't walk you can't be two more than two kilometers from your own house Yes, I can. Yes, I can. It says so in the Constitution. Sorry, you know, you don't have any say in the matter. I'm going where I want to go. But the, liber the liberals were the first one to, to talk about, you know, oh, the common good and let's save lives, you know, and all this sort of guff. Um, so something very sinister happened back then. Mm -hmm. And we still, we're still struggling to, to, to work out exactly what it was. We have a better idea now than we had then. And it's an extraordinary thing I, I find, you know, that uh, when I started off writing in Substack three years ago, I mean, I, I started where, where we were and started to describe things and pick up on certain themes like propaganda or whatever and write about those. But now I'm gone into all kinds of strange little cul-de-sacs and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, rabbit holes and whatnot that I never imagined even existed. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the psychological manipulation and all of this kind of stuff that is going on, you know, the, 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 the questions like, you know, did we ever have constitution republics at all? Were they just a, a, a con job from the beginning? I think that's very likely now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stunned still at the silence of people. And, and I meet people now who are like stalwart of, stalwart of heroes of mine, journalists way back 30, 40 years ago. And not alone have they nothing to say about any of this, they don't know that it's happened. They're talking, if you ask them, well, what do you think of things in Ireland? They'll start rambling about something completely irrelevant that happened 27 years ago. That shouldn't have happened, and if that hadn't happened, everything you know, we'd we'd have better roads now, or better telephones, or you know, some nonsense. As if they've got like a, they're gone senile, and they're not. They can talk about everything else, sport or whatever, perfectly normally, but ask them to talk about reality, and they can't do it. Yeah, it's like a psychological um, like, like there's gaps people have in their thinking that I you know in the old days. You could you could slag them, and that was the point of it. You you could speak freely as an Irish person without yes. fear of retribution. Yes. Now now we're 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 very careful what we say. We're very politically correct, and you know, as you were talking there, I was thinking that you know we're an island, and you know since the beginning, that might have given us a psychological protective layer. 
you know, I, like I was, I was up in Johnny Fox's up in up in Step Aside there years ago, and I was sitting there listening to the radio, drinking a pint of Guinness, and uh, it was it was it was um, the long wave, and uh, it was coming in and out, and I was thinking, what would it have been like in the Second World War? You know, I I you know they'd have to advance to England, the Nazis, and then from there to Ireland, they would they'd have the physical you know, obstacles to overcome. And so you sense a, a sense of being protected or isolated. But now we don't have that. There is no, I mean, now we can get um, pseudo immigrants just coming in by the truckloads or by the airplane loads. There is no natural defense. And I wonder if this has a psychological effect on our own thinking that we don't have that natural protective layer that we always had. Well, th that's possible, uh, Carl. I, I, I accept that I think it's, if it's the case, and it might be, I think it's a deeply unconscious process because I actually don't see any evidence that people are even registering any of these phenomena as actual problems. Yeah. I mean, for example, the, ma the mass invasion of our country, like, you know, and who knows, but, but like, you know, we used to say that we Irish people would be a minority in Ireland by 2050. A few years ago, we were saying that. that that's a that's a, a crazy dream now, at the rate things are going. You know, I, I think, you know, it's very likely that certainly by 2035, Irish people will be a minority. And you see, an awful lot of Irish people are scared of talking about this because they don't want to be called racists. And, and you know, and they comfort themselves, I think, with the idea that, oh, well, it shows how generous we are and compassionate we are. But you see, I, I keep saying to them, but you know, when we get to that tipping point, I call it the, the demographic singularity, when there will be more of them than there will be of us, right? It's like the, the AI singularity, when the, the machines are yeah. cleverer than we are. And, and there's just one more person than us one day, and we'll just be like a ping in the consciousness of the, the zeitgeist. And, and then from there on, I say to them, it won't be a matter of your compassion anymore, Paddy. It'll be a matter of their compassion. And you'll find that's a lot scarcer on the ground than yours has been. And that means that you won't have a home anymore in the world and your children won't have a home anymore in the world. See, these are the ramifications that nobody is allowed to speak about, which if they were, if we were able to talk about it, it would be over in a few days. People would say, no, stop, stop, stop. But people are not allowed to, they're told lies. They're told, you know, that this is analogous to Irish people having to leave Ireland in the 1840s because of the famines, where, where millions of people died and millions of people were displaced, and that this is exactly the same thing. Uh, but it's not the same thing at all. This is orchestrated by supranational powers. This is a deliberate strategy of replacement of our population. There was no question of that when people went to Canada. They were trying to create, these were trying to create a new country to break up into, into, into the wilds of Canada and make a new country. Now we're talking, we've on a small island, which, you know, 30 years ago, these politicians or their fathers, because they're all, they're all dynasties anyway, they were telling us that we can't all expect to live on one small island. That was when they couldn't possibly, they couldn't create jobs enough for the Irish. And now they tell us the world can come and there's no problem with that. And, and like they have no responsibility for that. Nobody's taking any responsibility for it. It's been done by in accordance with orders from outside. There's no reflection on it. There's no debate on it. There's no questioning of it permitted. And so, you know, it's sneaking up on us. And, and uh, I mean, it's, it's the greatest nightmare I've ever seen. I've never experienced in my life to see. It's heartbreaking. I mean, I genuinely, I'm not talking rhetorically. I mean, I am heartbroken by it because I know where it will end. It will end in Ireland becoming a South Africa in the, the Atlantic. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like one of the strategies, you know, of the victors over the conquered people is to erase their history, erase their culture, erase mm -hmm. their connection to the land <clears throat> so that the people don't know who they are. And that way they make them more malleable and controllable. Yes. And yeah. so it seems to be a global phenomena of, you know, there's always been an attack on indigenous peoples who have been living quite happily off the land and independent. Uh, and that needs to be, that connection needs to be broken 
to turn these people into into their minions and slaves. So this is I'm heartbroken too with the, what's happening to the country and the history, the rich history that we have here. You know, stone circles to you know just just the whole the whole thing and 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 the newcomers that are coming in, they're not being assimilated. It's too quick. No. It's too much. Too quick. And too, too many know, of them. Oh, too many, too of, many them of them coming. Them. Yeah. And, but you see, you're, you, what you've touched on there really is very important, you know, that the, you see, it's the attachment between the people and the place that they're trying to destroy. I mean, Irish, you know, Irish, uh, Irish people revere their landscape traditionally. You know, they, 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 it's, it's such a beautiful landscape. And, and, you know, the pagan past, you know, the pre-Christian past was intensely about that. And many remnants of that remained in the Irish version of Christianity and Catholicism, even though they weren't talked about because you're not allowed to have that uh, pantheistic kind of view of God or whatever in, in, in Catholicism. But nevertheless, they survived. And that's the thing they these guys hate, you know, these elites who, who want to destroy, who wanted the globalist elites who want simply to have consumers walking back and forth across a piece of territory, preferably a concreted over a piece of territory. Uh, and and that's that's what they are. And it's an extraordinary thing, you know, that this is being presided over by a government which includes a Green Party, as you, you know, which, you know, is the most anti-green thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. I mean, they don't want green. They use all of these instruments like climate change in order to achieve their, to scare people or to achieve blackmail, blackmail people into doing certain things or bully people. But uh, they don't care about any person, any tree, any blade of grass, any grain of sand on the entire planet Earth. They just want power and all, all that they think that will bring to them. Of course, the paradox of it is that when they destroy the human race, there will be no life on the planet for them to enjoy. They seem to forget that. You know, they see this, this is a mistake a lot of people make about things that they take for granted everything that is now and assume they can, you know, improve it by removing the obstacles that they think are in their way. The classic example I use is the big top, the circus. You know, where somebody walks into the big top and they say, oh, boy, that's a beautiful, this is a beautiful tent. Wow. But what's that pole doing in the middle? It's in the way. Can we get that out of there? Somebody gets a chainsaw and you know, the rest is history. You know, yeah. and that's what they're doing. Yeah. It's also, you know, um, some of these elites who, uh, well, let's say people of, of great means, um, you know, they believe that there's too many of us and they will probably want to retreat to Pacific islands and make it their own. Um, mm. And some of them talk about going off into space. And there's, yeah, there's, an, awful that. Lot, that. there's an awful lot of talk, but, but, what, but what is space? It's a dark, cold void. It's lifeless. Yeah. But don't and tell them, you, that. let them off. Let them off, Carl. Let, don't tell them. <laughs> Come yeah, on. and the planets are just, yeah, just rocky, inhospitable, in, inhospitable yeah. environments. And they don't see the life on Earth. It's thriving. No, there's, you know, and so, but people are sold into this and uh, this kind of thinking through science fiction from Star Trek in the 60s, yeah. I guess, to, to Elon Musk now and talking about this. And everybody... It's like fashionable to accept the latest technology because our hope is, is in that to redeem us and that um, people are yeah. not really part of nature. Uh, uh, we don't, you know, there's all these very subtle memes that come through that, that disconnect us. And then, it, then, you know, I can talk about, you know, the spiritual dimension where it disconnects us from who we are and, 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 and to the source by all these distractions, all these very subtle memes that come into our thinking and get yes. reinforced. So, um, well, yeah, they're, they're leading us up that path to, for the transhumanist uh, uh, world and, and in which we will be, our humanity will be half cyborg, half human, if at all. And, and uh, uh, that's a very real possibility because essentially that's the process of desouling humanity it's it's to to turn us into pure consumers pure you know uh, audience members pure you know observers uh, uh, all of the passive in everything 
and and just waiting to be to be waited upon uh, in by some machine or some servant or whatever. Uh, I mean, you know, when I and this is a very sad and 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 you know, in some ways, you know, I I don't like talking about it in these terms, but you can see by looking at humanity in the world now, in the West now. The shapes of human beings alone is deeply alarming as to the future possibilities of existence for man at all. Because if it's this bad as it is now, what's it going to be like after 20 years of the stuff that they're proposing where people will be more or less confined to little pods of apartments uh, watching screens all the time, having their food delivered to them? Uh, you know what is there to live for in that? Like, but and 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 when you actually think then, Carla, about this and 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 like, where are the churches? Where are the the, the theologians? Where are the philosophers? Where are the poets? The problem is that they too are all liberals, so-called pseudo-liberals, I call them, really, and and uh, they 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 don't want to interfere. Uh, because this is the market or something or you know it's the common good or something or whatever guff they've come up with this particular week and and really uh, we are heading headlong to hell and and it seems to be impossible to not alone to stop it i mean obviously that that goes without saying as it is as things are but it is impossible to even convince some of the nearest people to you that there is anything to be worried about because their propaganda has been so strong that the minute you open your mouth, you immediately replicate the predictions they've already made about you. They've warned everybody about your existence and what you say. They're waiting. Oh, and immediately you see the change. Oh, he's one of those. Mm, what do I do here now? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, it's nice. To, yeah. Well, it's nice meeting you anyway. And uh, we'll see you again next time. You know, nice to see you around. Yeah. Okay. Bye. You know, like it's extraordinary the way all of this you, is constructed. Did you, and I, I, I'm probably taking up all the time here. Um, do you, I, you know, I think of it as a virus, a mental virus yeah. that's, that spreads, you know. Whatever, you know, what it wasn't COVID, it was the mental virus, you know? Yeah. And so do you have comments on that? And, oh, I do. I, I, I think that's a very good way of seeing it. It was a mind virus, for sure. Uh, you know, there was, no re there was no virus at all, except that one, uh, which, which, which was like invisible and, and, and you know, <laughs> asymptomatic, <laughs> you know, except the, the, the symptoms were... Uh, um, as I say, mutism and uh, intense hostility towards anybody who questioned authority um, or who disobeyed a diktat from the authorities. Uh, really, you see, what I find about that period, it's hard to describe, but, you know, that I was struck by this feeling again and again was that all my life had been lived in the wrong direction. Because all of this stuff was so regressive that I must have slipped backwards in time. I couldn't possibly be still moving into the future because that was, I had picked up the idea that the future was to be a better place, which meant a freer place, a more decent place, a place where there, were more, there was more reason and reasonable laws and people were you know, kinder and so on. And everything seemed to be happening in the opposite direction. So I, you know, I used to look at the clock and say, is that clock really moving backwards? You know, and, and that's the feeling I still have, that they have, const they have actually moved, put time into reverse. And, it's, and I believe it's accelerating in that reverse gear, even though we can't really notice it yet. That, that you know, I suspect that now some, we might be somewhere around 1847 now, you know, or something like that again, on the way back to the Middle Ages, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. I'm going to pass you on to Roy here. Roy here. I see he's got his mute button off and he's fighting at the bit. Thanks, John. So you you were talking about uh, the the climate change, and I mean that's pushed all around the world. But what I've noticed, and I've got confirmation in Cork. I know it happens in a lot of countries in Holland as well. 
they're getting us all to recycle. It's something I was doing anyway because I believe just to recycle is a good thing to do. I was doing it before it became popular when you had to bring it to the thing. But they're burning everything. So they're getting everybody to wash this off, segregate it, and they're just com- they're just dumping it in the same place. So people are actually thinking they're doing right for the environment that's going to be recycled and everything, and they're just burning the whole lot of it. Yes. Yes, that's right. I, you know, I, I, I get into arguments with people about that because I, I have never... I mean, I obviously, I don't go out of my way to be a nuisance in, the, in these matters, but I, I, I mean, people have debates around me, uh, you know, uh, my in-laws and my sisters-in-law and about, you know, a particular kind of plastic, you know, they'll, they'll hold up this particular kind of plastic and say, no, no, that doesn't go in the black bin, that goes in the, no, it doesn't go in the green bin, it goes in the brown bin. No, 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 I, no, no, it's, that is definitely, the, I say, listen, give it to me, give it to me. Okay. They're trying to destroy the world. Can we stop talking nonsense? You know, and and, and uh, you know that's that's the amazing thing about it. That I, it struck me great that actually the other day, like that, I got this image like that because all the time you're walking along or running along, and it's like you're in two different realities. One is the kind of old reality, you know. It's like your left foot is in the old reality, but the right one is in the other in in some other reality, and this is a chasm which is opening up very slowly between the two. So for the moment, you can kind of go along in both, but you know that before very long, you're going to have to choose to stay in the old world or go into the new one, because you won't be able to kind of keep, you'll be, you'll be doing the splits eventually if you keep trying to, to stay on that, on, that, uh, on that gap. And, and that strikes me about, you know, that like all the time I feel now that if we could only explain that to people, that that's what they're, they're doing, that that's the, that's the mode they've put us into. And because it, it fills me with despair sometimes, you know, in a strange way, because, you know, you're having a conversation with somebody and you find yourself entering into it, a plan, you know? Like I was talking yesterday to my daughter and she's doing her degree, degree this year and then she's going to do a master's. And she was talking in Galway, which is, you know, about, 50 miles away and you know getting there and so on and you know I'm, I'm entering that into that enthusiastically of course as you would but at a certain point there comes this awful sense but none of this may happen none of this is may be permitted the, the world is over our world is over unless we do something about that and and this is a such a chilling and, and devastating idea that I, I want to tell people, but I can't because they'll think I'm crazy. And anyway, they won't let me on any medium that I could speak to the entire country in, from. And if I did, they would think I was even crazier. And you know, by the time I got off, there would be men in white coats waiting at the door with a stretcher and a, and a, and a, a hypodermic stre- syringe. Uh, you know, and, and that's kind of, I, I think there's so many dimensions of this that, are in a sense more terrifying than even the stuff they're doing. It's the 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 ricochet effect of what they're doing. You know, like it struck me recently. I mean, I've talked about this a lot, but it, it's that we live in a world now without consequences for power because there's no media. Like we forget that the reason that power was imp- consequences were imposed on the powerful in the past was there was a watchman, there was vigilance. There was supervision on behalf of the people. And that was the media. But you take that away. It's not just that you don't trust them that's full of lies and I can't believe what's there. That's, that's yes, an aspect. But it's what that means. And what it means is that actually they can now lie with complete impunity. And it, they can even tell you the truth. And, 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 and it's terrible. And they, they, they can admit to, to mass murder in a certain sense. And it doesn't matter. Like there was a situation here where the prime, the, the teacher, the prime minister, um, last week, last January, was asked about the numbers of excess debts in the parliament in the Dáil. And now, there are quite significant, have been for two and a half years, significant increase spikes, like in you know something like twenty percent for you, that which in any other situation would be a dramatic crisis. But when they talk about, they refuse to talk about what it is which we know what it is, but they refuse to talk about that. 
and they come up with all kinds of crazy ideas that are, you know, just like, oh, it's climate change. That's causing people to die. But the best, the, the worst one was, the worst one, rather than the best one, the best and the worst one was, you know, when we when the lockdown started, the one that we were warning that the consequences of this would be pretty drastic. Had they calculated, had they done their, you know, precautionary principle thing, where they measure not just the danger they're seeking to deal with, but the, the damage, potential damage of the of the measures they're using. Have they done that? Of course they hadn't. And and well they say, and then we said, well, you know, people will will die because they won't be getting uh, scans or operations or even you know, monitoring of their illnesses. And people will die because of, you know, the effect of, you know, social distancing on the ecology of infection and immunity. And they dismiss that. Oh, well, you're not a you're not a virologist. Where did you where do you so study your uh, microbiology? Well, you know, and this sort of stuff, you know. And then in the part in the doll in the parliament last uh, early in the year, the, the Taoiseach Prime Minister was asked about excess deaths. And of course, he wanted above all to avoid the question of what it really is, which is that people are dying of injections. And he started saying, well, well, that's, you know, that's because, uh, you know, of social distancing and, and uh, you know, it's also because people didn't get to get to have their, uh, you know, scans and the, the, the kind of treatments they would have probably had. And nobody stood up and said, but you caused all that. You're the guy who announced all that. You're the guy who imposed that on the people. You're now saying that you're responsible for the deaths of thousands of people. You're admitting it. It doesn't really matter whether they died of a vaccine or if they died of social distancing. They're dead. And you're now saying you're responsible. But nobody said it to him. And the media didn't say it to him. So there's a complete kind of vacuum of response. And that means there are no consequences. He can say that with a smirk on his face. And say, well, no, no, it's not what you think it is. You're, I know what you're getting at. I know what you're getting at. <laughs> you know, it's not that. <laughs> it's this. And I know you, you, you might think that I, I was responsible for that, but I don't care about that either. You can go. This is an international thing. And like we've got an audience of, like I, I think last time I checked, there was over 130 countries. And I don't think people realize, because we see all the Muppet show that's going on in America at the moment, thinking that one party is going to save you or the other, same in the UK. I mean, I think Ireland is the best example of what crap we've got, because the left and the right, Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil, had to come together. Then people were thinking Sinn Féin with the saving grace, and you could see them all masked up. They'd done so many bad things that you just kind of realize. And then some thought people before profit were going. And I was seeing emails from them where they were promoting the transgender in the schools. So you're like, that's the whole political system in Ireland. And yes. that's replicated across the world. Yes, that's right. There's no, there's no opposition anymore now, except what they call the far right. And in fact, it's the other way around. Anybody who opposes them is deemed to be far right. Is there isn't any far right as, as in any meaningful sense, except insofar as that's what they call anybody who dissents from what they dictate. Uh, the left, in this is the remarkable thing about all this, has been the, the, the fate of the left, you know, which used to be the voice of working people, uh, is now the voice of the corporations, uh, is pushing globalism on the people, uh, is using migrants and gay people and, and so on as human shields in effect to, to conceal and to protect themselves uh, uh, in, in their actions. And this is culture of Marxism. This is the nature of it. And, and that's what we have now in all our countries. Uh, we have a form of Marxism, which is radical and, and, and uh, uh, quite disconnected from a lot of the, the fundamental uh, meaning and content of Marxism, but the mechanisms are the same, you know, the, the whole question of leveraging a kind of a particular class in, in, Mar in the case of the Marxist model, uh, the communist model, the proletariat, uh, you now have the victim classes being used in this way as, you know, I mean, I'm using the victim classes in a kind of a, with quotation marks because they don't necessarily see themselves like that, but by virtue of being a quote unquote minority, they qualify as that. So if you're gay or if you're black, if you're a colored person of color, as they say, uh, whatever it is, 
then you're part of that coalition of the victims. Uh, I call them the omnipotent victims because what you can't, the, the ordinary person, the, the rest of the population, whatever is left uh, of the population, cannot question anything they say or want. I mean, if they say they're offended by something you said and that means you're a racist, then you're a racist and that's what the law will decide as well. You know, the, all reason is gone. Everything is, is, is leveled of our civilizational principles. And, and indeed, the conventions and the charters and the constitutions are gone too. Uh, and again, this should be momentous. It, there should be nothing else to talk about except this. But nobody mentions it in the mainstream at all. It's just like it doesn't, everything is, everybody, it's in, in a time warp, you know. It's like you talk, people talk about things, as I say, as if they were talking in 2002 or something like that, when, when what they're saying would have made some sense but they don't know what's actually going on now or are pretending not to. With, like you mentioned at the start, how toxic Twitter is by demonic Musk, because if you know Satanism and look at all the symbolism, you'll see what he's doing. But basically on Twitter, our so-called leader on his own Twitter feed had a picture the other day and I went in and saw it and he's basically getting the flu jab, which he's trying to push. And there is no injection there. And you're looking at that. He's a World Economic Forum puppet, just like a lot of the leaders around the world. But like when you see no accountability for something like that, for that straight away, that is fraud. He should be like just locked well, up for life or something like that. Well, you know, I think it's worse than fraud, uh, than, than, than fraud Roy, because I, I think he, he, he did that knowingly. I mean, I think we need to move a step beyond what appears to be there. Like what we saw was a nurse who had no gloves holding, making the shape as though she was holding a The invisible dart. Uh. Yeah, and there was nothing there. There was no trace. There was no shadow. There was nothing. Uh, but my sense is that's what was intended. That was what was intended so that people would start to talk about this. And it really is, again, the, the, the finger to people. We don't care what you say because we're, we're, we're beyond accountability. You know, you just think about it like what's going on now is a, is a cover up of a crime. And it's a cover up that involves 98 percent, perhaps or more of the establishments of all our societies. They're all in on it. And so the question is, I say, well, you know, because people keep it on our side, keep saying, oh, something, something's happened. And, oh, it's over now because, you know, there's this revelation. And I said, it's not over. It's not over. This has happened before. We've had countless examples of things that have come out that should have been the front page of every newspaper and should have brought the whole thing to a stop. But that would have been true in the world that was, the world on the left side, of, on your left, under your left foot. But the world under your right foot is not like that. And that's the one you're, you're going to have to choose soon which one you're going to be in. And uh, because there's no consequences in this new world. And, and who do you send out to arrest the perpetrators? The guys who did, who were part of the, the crime in the first place, because they're all there. They're the judges, they're the police, they're the, the civil servants, they're the politicians, they're the doctors, they're the nurses, they're everybody. So how do you arrest everybody? And how, who were, does the arresting? Like, did the judges take turns to try each other? You know, you go up, you go up first and try me, and uh, you try me, and then I'll go up and try you, and we'll get that cop over there. Uh, we'll try him, then he will get him to arrest us and take us to jail, and then that guy over there will take him to jail. Yes, that's a good plan. Let's do that. It's not going to happen. I've I've had over a hundred court cases, and a lot of them in Ireland regarding property. And I could see the fraudulence that went on with the judges and basically just giving every single barrister ruled in their favor, plus class, plus you know, interest rates for everyone. It was disgusting to see. Yes. And like with your experience, and we see how all the families are fighting now. Everybody has their own belief system, unfortunately. And I know from because I get a lot of help people on all the natural stuff is being taken down. People are doing their research and they're believing what they see. How would you recommend 
let somebody do their research to try to find the truth because there's so much shite out there we don't know what to believe well uh, i i I think you have to treat everything contentiously. You know, you have to look at, you know, you develop your own. There's, you see, it's a new world in this sense as well. I mean, we're used to a world where there was kind of singular channels of communication. You know, like in Ireland, we had certain pro well, I remember Ireland when it had just one channel. And you probably too. I, too I do. And, and when we had two, I was the remote control. They tell me go over yeah. and change the channel. And anyway, there was nothing on the second one anyway for years afterwards. So you didn't, nobody bothered watching it because you didn't. Everybody still watched the number one, you know. And, and 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 but you see, this is all now changing. That that what we have now. You see, you got your paper. If you were on the Late Late Show on a Saturday night back then. You would be, were famous in Ireland for about two months. Um, that's not true anymore. So the world is fragmenting. And, and, and in a certain sense, even now, we can't contemplate how will we understand the world if we're all looking at different things at any given moment. How, but it will work, I think. And it's already working. And I, I can see it in my own kind of, you know, because I'm subject, we're all subject to the same conditions where we watch lots of stuff maybe, and some of it we kind of think is more trustworthy than other. But we kind of, what I, the way I do is I look at as much as I can of everything, bits and pieces of different things. I don't sit watching something for, for two hours if, if it's not interesting, but I, I get try and glean the, the, the essence of it. What's hard to say? And the way I've said I, I do it is, I treat it like I'm building this dry stone wall. Uh, you know, my, my, my uncles used to build with, with stones but without any cement. And they would have big piles of stones around them, you know, and, and they would start building. And then they, as they got, the wall got higher, you know, they, they, they would become more particular about the kind of stones because the size had to be right. And they would just keep trying a stone and that wouldn't put it aside, they wouldn't throw it away. You know, it, it gradually it will build, and I think that's the way you have to do it: is to kind of hear each thing, uh, assess it in the context of the knowledge you already have. Don't be kind of overwhelmed and swayed by any particular thing. Don't kind of just jump on everything and on one, any one thing and say, "Oh, this is it now; it's over." You know, it's because it's not over. You know, but it's you hear the thing and you say, "Okay, that that," and then in two days later you might hear a different version of it. And that kind of either confirms it or maybe rattles it in some way. I think this is a new way of, of like, whereas once we just sat there and, and received the feed and whatever was in it, and, and we that was our position. That, that's what happened. You know, that's gone. Because, you know, we're into the world now. We're entering into the era of deep fakes, and which is, is kind of, in these terms, completely unprecedented. Because in a very short time, in a couple of years, it won't be possible to trust any imagery that you see online because everything is fakeable everything is 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 falsable falsifiable so you can you know i could uh, i you know i could uh, uh, be 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 in carl's room there you know like somebody could do that very easily and and they would be but the meaning of that would be that if that was ever to be evidenced it would be pointless there would be no evidence about anything visually uh, you know, uh, the chat GPT can do, can imitate the style of James Joyce and write a novel. Maybe. We're getting There's even that. a podcast now with Joe Rogan and kind of guests that he wouldn't have on. That's AI. And to be honest with you, you listen to it and you think it's Joe Rogan. There's no way you would know the difference. Really? I haven't seen that. Yeah. yeah. And does it, yeah. Well, you see, th this is like, you, you, don't you see? Can you see though uh, that this is an unlivable world? You know, it, 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 there is nothing that is human in it. I don't mean just mean that it's it's not Joe Rogan really in that sense. It's not human, but it's it's like it's so fantastical and pointless because it's not rooted in 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 the only purpose of anything in the world, which is to enact human relationships in time you know it's like economics that they've, they've, they've bastardized economics by making money about itself money is supposed to be about the effort and work and reward that humans give each other that's the process that's how gold came into being as money 
It wasn't because it was intrinsically valuable. It had no value other than stones in the ground. But it acquired value by virtue of its use in human endeavor. And, and without human endeavor, there is no life. There's no point. I don't think, they, again, I don't think they've thought about that. It's the old big top thing again, you know. Let's get the, get the humans out of here, you know. It struck me actually a few years ago. I was in the Dublin airport. We were going somewhere, myself and my wife, you know. And they had just introduced these uh, new machines for tagging your luggage. And, out, you know, so you, you could do it yourself. And uh, But there were two or three, on each one of them, there were two or three staff members who were teaching everybody how to do it, which seemed to defeat the purpose, but it was a short-term thing, I guess. But then I looked over at the, 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 the desks, you know, over the line of desks where the queues used to be, and there were no queues. But there were still people behind the desks, the table. The desk, and I, but they had nothing to do, because everybody was either tagging their bag or getting their, their, their uh, boarding pass from a different machine. And I thought, mm, this is very, this is progress, isn't it? It's great, yeah. But then it struck me, you know, and for an economy to work, you need people on both sides of the counter. You need somebody inside and you need somebody outside. And the guy outside today was probably on another, at another counter on the inside yesterday. You know, and, and vice versa and so on. That that's the nature of human interaction. And this is the whole point of everything. And this is how money came into being. And this is how people got rich. But then they thought getting rich was the best part of it and the only part that was really ma that really mattered. So they decided, let's have the getting rich part without all the other stuff. Forgetting you can't do that. There is no getting rich without the other parts. There's no rich. There's no nothing. You know, like, you know, if you impoverish the whole world, tell me this, I don't know, unless you're a psychopath, and they are, of course they are, but, like, what's the point in having a Rolls Royce driving down the, a, a squalid town where people are out scraping, to picking up scraps off the ground to eat? If you destroy the world to the extent that the human race is incapable of being able existing, what's the point in being able to drive down the main street in your, in your Rolls Royce smoking a big cigar? I mean, even if you take it at, the, at its most venal, there's no satisfaction in it, is there? How could there be? Have they taught this true to any degree whatsoever? I asked them, even on their own terms, which are pretty squalid and 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 uh, you know narrow. But even on those terms, they don't appear to have applied any thought to what, where it's going, or how it's going to end. If we look at how to make change, I had a guy today on my crypto podcast, and uh, he used to work for uh, Chapter Eleven bankruptcies for Fortune five hundred companies. And he left it because he realized I wasn't bringing any value to the world. And I think we, everybody needs to do that, to think, because if you look at most of the city officials, they're not bringing value to the world. They're taxing people. They're just making their life miserable and everything. Yeah. And that's the only way we can actually have change is say, does this job really, is this job actually beneficial or is it just a job for the sake of job's sake? And that's the problem. Like, you know, and you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, am I actually making a positive impact on the world or I'm actually making it worse? Well, exactly. It's like building a house, house of cards. And, you know, at a certain point, you realize that you're in borrow, on borrowed time and that the next level may be the one that brings the whole thing down. And that's fine with the house of cards because that's the, the, that's the kick out of building it. But if you do that with the world, you're sure to bring the world down. And there's no kick except the one you get in the face when it all happens. Listen, John, thanks very much. I'll pass you over to Grace. Hey, John, Roy, Carl. I, oh, what happened? Let's see. Oops. Yeah. I almost lost you in the screen. Anyway, um, I'm in agreement with everything you were all discussing, and you painted a picture that is really you know, it brings out the emotions that you're, you're extremely sad. I'm extremely sad about what's happening. But at the same time, it, w it seems like I want, I don't want to lose the hope that it could get better. Okay. And that's why I want to, I want to bring it back to the article and the title of the wonder of you. What happens, what happens to that humanity with all the wonders that we have? I, I, I 
And when I see the word wonder, I, I, and I want to talk about it, I want to talk about it not just as a noun, but also as a verb. When I, oh, I was raised in the Philippines, and I can't help but still be so ama amazed with the wonders of what I see every time I go home, because it's so many islands, so many fantastic things, and oceans, everything. But and one of the best wonders that I always see and experience, and it keeps me real, is when I see my family and other families who are not well off, right? And yet they're so happy, okay? They're happy, they're engaged in their lives, and the relationship is more generally beautiful. Then when mm -hmm. I visited I, in Ireland, I was at all looking at the scenery of the oceans, the, the, uh, the, the rock formations that I see. So I can't help but think that there should be much more offered to us that this is just a passing through time for us. And that if it's in every one of us will remember that there's wonder, that, there, that we are one wonderful, that, it, that maybe we can tap that spark or spark our consciousness that sooner or later, somewhere, will it could be better. As they said, when you clean up a, your house or you clean up your closet, it gets so crazy bad before it makes it it's beautifully organized. And I wouldn't even, I, I'm not in disagreement that we cannot explore space or use AI because there's many things that are wondrous coming from AI. And also this, like using my phone, losing this technology, right? And then, then we have that um, space because space for me is still part of nature, part of the creation that is so, uh, there's still so much secrets in the creation. So John, I know you are always in connection or have a conversation with, and you wonder about the philosophers and theologians. Maybe we could, you could start on sharing to us what happened with our educational system or the family. Because I believe if it's in the future, it will really get so much worse than they didn't just create these things overnight. And they, when they say they, the globalist hegemonic control and all over the world made really knew that the gem of the family that it starts with a me one member of the family. They hit that right on so that they could just take all the wonders in us. So share yeah. me your thoughts on that, please. Well, it, you see, Grace, the, uh, it seems to me that um, the problem is not, for example, the AI. I mean, that, that isn't the problem. The problem is the problem of control, that, that we have been tricked even though we are supposed to live in democracies here in the West, for example, we have been treated as if that weren't the case. And, and we allowed it to happen, that it wasn't the case. I mean, you know, I remember back in the 80s, uh, 30 years ago, when I was an editor of uh, magazines and, and we used to do, a, even then we were carrying articles about the future of work and the, the impact of technology on human existence and meaning and so on. And so clearly there was a, a, an anticipation at that moment that, you know, we needed to pay attention and we needed to be involved in a discussion uh, as to how the changes in the world were to be managed so as to ensure that humanity continued to be at the centre as, as, as humans, not as slaves, you know, that we were to be a democratic uh, uh, corpus in the world and that we would have ownership and control in the sense of democratic control, if, if whatever that is, or whatever it might be optimized as. But instead what happened is that we had allowed the process to happen whereby through the, the, this pseudo wave of prosperity, our attention was distracted into consumerism. And for 20 years, we didn't even think about these things again. 
And then suddenly we wake up and we find that the whole technology that is going to govern the future is owned by a tiny elite who don't want us to have any say over it. In fact, they want to use it to imprison us and to surveil us and to make sure that we don't think even, even think anything that they don't agree with. Now, that's an example of, of what's kind of happened in the world. And, you know, that's a terrifying thing because even though I, I agree that, you know, we should, where possible, try to strike optimistic notes and hopeful notes, we must also be realistic and describe for people who haven't understood what's actually happening so that they at least know that there's something that they need to fight and resist. And, and uh, so uh, the, the, all of this, you know, the, the education, I mean, there, there's, there are people, and I, I don't disagree with them, I don't know uh, for sure how long this has been going on, but there are those who say it's been going on for hundreds of years. I don't think personally that it was going on for hundreds of years in Ireland. I think that, that I could certainly say anyway that Ireland was so impoverished and so insignificant up to relatively recently that they just didn't take any interest in us and they couldn't be, they didn't think we were much of a prize. So they left us alone. And because I mean, in general, you know, I mean, of course, there were flaws in Ireland, Irish society and culture as we grew up. And they're well documented uh, and in fact exaggerated in, in lots of places. But it was a pretty peaceful place to live, apart from the, struggle, the, the war in the north, which was, in a certain sense, a different uh, territory. Um, but it was a pretty peaceful place, and it was a, a happy place, and a place that, as a young person, there was great optimism and, and, and a sense of possibility. You know, a sense that even if things were bad, economically otherwise, that they could be made better, and that they could be made better by our own lights not in the way that they were eventually made better, which was by other people's lights. But again, by the same process that the technology was taken over, Ireland was taken over. So, you know, uh, and the education system was constructed, reconstructed to, to reflect those values or anti-values rather than actually to educate the young, to be open-minded and, and critical in their thinking and questioning. And uh, television, of course, and, you know, I think, I mean, I, again, uh, you know, we. I think that television was better. We didn't have a TV until I was in my twenties, uh, so I didn't see much TV uh, back in the in the sixties and seventies. But my general sense was that the quality of it was it wasn't very much of it. There was one channel, as we say, but it, well, it was pretty okay. You know, the bits and pieces that they produced were pretty good. But now it is not. I mean, I, I, if I'm in a room with a television set now, I have to leave it within within 30 seconds, you know, because I can't bear, if I can't turn off or break the television, I have to get out of the room. And and that's all of these forces. Then you have the internet and Twitter and all that stuff, which are really, you know, reducing the human race to like a, a, a race of zombies. Because they're actually passive now. You know, this is, the way, you know, uh, there was a book came out, you know, about... 15 years ago by a guy called Nicholas Carr called The Shallows. And he was talking about the difference between reading on a page as a page, reading on a screen. And, you know, as I said earlier, you know, that this, the page is, there, is at the heart of democracy because there's a different response to the page. You know, you read a, you read a book, you know, and you, you, you kind of, you take it up and you, you, you know, in a, in a cafe or whatever, and you look and you, and then you look out the window, you know, and you're, you, it's slower. It's, it's much slower. And you, you know you can go back and, and read and then you can turn back the page. But I find that, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the, the iPhone or whatever, it's an entirely different process. It's agitated. And it's like a kind of a, a, a harvesting of crude information. You know, it's going kind of to get to the end of that and then read another one, you know, and, and try, what's, what's this guy saying? It's not this guy writes really nice sentences or... I like the way he's, he's using kind of irony or, I, you know, it's like, what's he saying? What's he saying? It's all very, it's like a memo. Everything's a memorandum, you know? And, and I think that all of these forces have come to bear on, on our, our humanity, on the humanity of the human race. Whereby, you know, and so I hate to say things like this, but sometimes I'm in places. I was in a railway station waiting room yesterday looking at people. I, you know, you would see more visible signs of intelligence in a field of cows. 
I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. Everybody's just kind of there as if waiting to be taken somewhere. You know, um, I remember like, you know, like human beings used to be electric. They used to be alive. They used to be, you know, in your face. They're not anymore. I, I don't know what is it. Is it antidepressants? Is it mass hypnosis? Is it something in the water? Uh, is it, you know, um, this mutism thing I'm talking about? But, but people are half dead. And they, 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 they're terrified that you might actually say something challenging to them. or and, and if you did, that somebody would hear it and think that they approved of it. Somebody they know, say, do you know that? Do you know him? What's he saying to you? Who do you know this guy? You know, he sounds like a far writer to me. What are you, what are you, what's he talking to you for? You know, it's all this stuff. The human race is in, is literally heading for the plug hole. You can see it spinning round as it's just approached that hole in the, it goes, we're just kind of, you know, that's where we are, even without all this other stuff. Even without all the, the, the elites or the whatever they are, you know, the combine or the, the predator class or the Illuminati, even without them, we're doing a fine job of destroying ourselves. But of course, they're orchestrating a lot of these mechanisms anyway. We, we know that now, too. So, and I mean, again, I'm saying this, this is I'm back again, Grace, sorry, into a kind of a very black, you know, depiction of things. But it's not an untruthful predict depiction. No, I'm but it's it's. It's good to know when. But but yes, I, no, I the mean, one. It's, it, yes, no, what I, you're I, saying I, makes some sense, John. And yes, but then, but then, yes. Sorry. So I can actually finish. I can actually then turn because the the point about the article I wrote, and I've, this has been a theme of mine for a long time now. It's in the context of what we call religion, really. What I would refer to emphasize as transcendent understandings. In other words, that I, I believe that regardless of what's true or not about God or gods or whatever, that the human being seems to bear all the hallmarks of having been created with a sense of a destination that inspires him or her. And that, therefore, the optimal condition for the human being in reality is to walk, to be moving through this dimension confidently, is you know, relatively steadily, moving towards a, des a destination that is at, at the end of a path that promises something great. And if we can achieve that, the best way of achieving that is with wonder, with the sense of wonder. Like, there was a, an Italian priest called uh, Luigi, Luigi, Luigi Gisani who wrote a book called The Religious Sense. Uh, he's dead now, but there's, it's, a, it's quite a complex book. It's a beautiful book, but on page 100 of the book, there's a paragraph where he kind of talks about how, you, how, how to be in the world. And, and it's kind of like an antidote to what we're all the things we're talking about. You know, that how do you how do you not be in that prefabricated world that they've made us live in? And it, what he said was, imagine yourself being born. Imagine that at this moment, and he meant literally now, you, Grace, you, Roy, yeah, like every one of us. Imagine that we're being born. And, but you can bring to this moment all of your understandings, all of your memories, all of your intelligence, all of your everything, because you will need them to answer, you know, what, you know, to answer, you know, what, what do I feel? And he said, you, so you come out of your mother's womb into the world as it is where you are. And what do you see? Light, color, things, me. What's this? You know, what what are what's your response? He says your response is astonishment. Astonishment, which is another word for wonder. 
But their second response, following hard on this, is, I didn't make myself. And this is the foundational understanding that allows us to go off onto that path and walk that path towards that uncertain, unknowable point of, it, of destination. And that's, we're driven by that, the quality that, the quality that drives us is wonder. Curiosity, but wonder fundamentally. And the, the phrase that he used to use was only wonder knows. Our wonder is what educates us to the meaning of reality and makes us walk on. And, and that's, that's the antidote to all of this stuff, I think. Fundamentally, it's in the most beautiful, succinct way. Uh, and I mean, I, I've, I've used that. I remember years ago, my daughter is 27 now. And, and when she was a child, about 12, 13 years ago, she got fell into a conversation. We were in Spain and, and she fell into a conversation with uh, her cousins who were, you know, the kind of, you know, neo-atheists. They were somewhat older than her and of, that are pretty typical of Ireland now. And she she came, she, she had a, you know, belief in, in God, whatever that is, and you know whatever she is for her, and so on. But uh, that night she came in. I was going to sleep, and she knocked on my door, and she came in, and she was in tears, and she said, "Dad, I, I'm I'm terrified that there's nothing. I'm terrified there's nothing." And I said, "Who? Why do you think there's nothing?" And and. Uh, she said, I just, you know, like, how, how do we know there isn't? I said, well, I said, oh, I, and I used Dasani's model, but I, I did it in a different way. And uh, what I did was, her birthday was the 10th of March. So I decided, okay, so you were conceived, let's say you were conceived on the 10th of June. I can't remember the exact date, but 10th of June. Uh, 1995, 18, sorry, yeah, uh, 1995, yes. Okay, 10th of June, that's the day of your conception. To go back to the 9th of June, one day before that, in which you are where? Nowhere? In nothingness? Be wherever you think you would have been. But you can equally bring all of your experience now and all of to answer it, because I want to ask you a question. You're there in this nothingness, but you have consciousness, say, for the purpose of this exercise. And I want to ask you just one question. What do you think is possible? And she said, nothing. How can I? Nothing. She says, yes. But here you are now in the middle of everything in the world with all of this, the Mediterranean, Spain, the mountains. And all you're thinking about is nothing. You were in the middle of everything and you think of nothing. How is this rational? How is this, how is this anything but fatalism? You know, and, and, and personally, I mean, I know there's religions and all this fighting about our dogmas and doctrines. I don't, I don't really care too much. It's interesting in its own way, but I don't care. I mean, I, this, this is fundamental. That that's enough for me to walk that path with my head in the air, watching the horizon, watching for movement, watching for signs. That's enough. And that's what the world needs, to return that capacity to itself, to be fully human and to be stretched towards infinity in, in space. That's gone. We've lost that now. That's why people are beaten. That's why people are giving in to all this stuff. This was the first thing they did to them. They attacked not their souls, they attack their imaginations because they stop being able to imagine the great the greatness that they seem surely to belong to. I think this is the best place to end for now. <laughs> Yes, it's good. It's, 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 and, I, uh, I, 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 never like to, I never like to be first, to be forced to be optimistic because it's <laughs> it's against my nature in a way because I see all the bad stuff. But I think really the world is optimistic. Hum, human existence is optimistic, and and there's no reason we just need to remember that that 
that we are born for greatness. There's no other reason for being here other than for the greatness that we belong to. And then that we remain to have that free will choice if you want to keep your wonder or not. Okay, yes. so it's, and wonder just like love, just like love is not just a, a noun, it's an action. So keep your wonder by knowing what's real, what's happening in the world. So I, I, it's not that we want to deny those things. But let me share this one viewer who, for him, this is his wonder, and it made him happy. Said, I, hi, I'm from Nova Scotia yesterday talking to five strangers on my job and the conversations went right to the world we live in and what's coming. It was like a breath of fresh air. People are waking up. I was excited all day because of it. See, it doesn't take much for us to wonder and have that empowering feeling. So thank you, John. And uh, yes, you can get in touch with John and, and his substack, okay? Uh, the johnwaters.substack.com. That's he's very easy to find, and uh, uh, thank you. Um, we will um, share all this uh, into in different platforms for Roy and I. And so just keep an eye on it when he publishes his. I publish mine in all different platforms. And please like, subscribe, support, and our guest all the time just as you also support any other guests and also our podcast. And thank you so much for sharing this time, John. Have a good evening. And to all my buddies, they're all evening, John, for also for Roy, that's evening now in his side. And for Carl, it's evening as well. So thank you so very much. Thank and you all. we do hope that you all can stay well and safe okay take care so i hope you enjoyed this week's podcast you'll find everything about me on bio.link forward slash podcaster with all my podcasts and you find it you see in the qr code in the graphic that's shown i'd like again to thank my sponsors so if you or someone you know struggling with anxiety and want to know how to be 100 percent anxiety free six weeks without therapy or drugs daniel packard's anxiety solution program company offers a six-week system that permanently solves anxiety at an astounding 90% success rate. People who join the program only pay at the end once they have clear, measurable results. If you're interested in learning more, go to permanentanxietysolutions.com where you can book a free consultation with Daniel. Do you fight blood pressure and or want to get off the meds? Doctors are amazed at what Zona Plus can do. You can get a $50 discount with my code Roy, zona.com slash discount slash Roy. And you'll see it in the QR code as well as Daniel's QR code. Quality manufacturer of metal products for telecommunication and workshop equipment and other metal materials. You'll see the brochure there in the QR code. And let me know if you would like a quotation shipped internationally at very competitive price. I'd like to thank all my sponsors and also all my listeners. Be sure to give me a thumbs up, five star rating, share with your friends, really helps. And I also have a video on how to give a five star rating because a lot of people have wrote to me asking me that they don't know how to do that. Until next week, take care.